Good morning, welcome to HOPE. My name is Kaylin Larson and I'm on our staff team here. We're really excited that you're joining us online this morning. In just a few moments, the band is going to lead us through a couple worship songs. And after that, Pastor Cor is going to preach through the back half of Hebrews 2, specifically talking about how Jesus has brought us into his family. At the end of service, we would like to invite you and your household to partake in communion. There'll be a document posted on in the Facebook comment section to guide you through that process. Taking communion is a powerful reminder of what Jesus has done for us. We get to reflect and remember on his death and his powerful resurrection. Now, we know that worshiping at home is hard. As a staff, we recognize that. And right now, we want to invite you to join the rest of Hope Online uh, for a moment of prayer. And so you will see prompts come up on the screen. And for 60 seconds, just a minute, take a moment to either pray through all the prompts, maybe one, maybe two, and then I will come back and close us in prayer. Father, we are grateful uh, for who you are. We thank you for your wonderful truth, the way that you have revealed yourself to us through your word. Uh, Lord, open our hearts and minds as we um, take in your word this morning, uh, specifically in Hebrews 2. We love you, Lord. Amen. <laughs>
pass unbelief.
Well, good morning, Hope Community Church. Happy Sunday to you. And if you are new or checking out Christianity here this morning, I want to just give you a quick heads up on who we are. Our um, church is named Hope Community, and we are about honoring God by helping as many people as possible become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So there's three parts to that. We want to honor God. Everything we do, uh, from small groups to different events in our community, in our area, trying to help out, um, whether we're gathering together or scattering, everything that we do, we want to be about glorifying and honoring God. Secondly, we want to help as many people as possible. Hope Community is not designed to be a a huddle, uh, a family that is inward looking only, but rather that we would turn outward and try to impact other people with this message uh, of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But the third part, we want to help as many people as possible become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Not just get them to come into a building or come to a service. Not get them to just pray a prayer or to give financially. But to help them become fully devoted followers of Jesus in every area of their life is impacted by this Christian faith. So that's, that's who we are. That's what we're about here as a church community. And what that means for us in this time is we want to help you to honor God by go, going deeper, becoming a fully devoted follower based on what we see in God's word. Currently, we are in the fourth week uh, in a study of the book of Hebrews. And if you don't know where that is, it's in your New Testament. You can look in the book of contents or, or uh, your, your Bible on your phone will be able to find it very quickly. But uh, Jesus is Greater is the title of our sermon series. And we're going to see that throughout this book. But let me just give a quick recap of where we've been. Uh, The first week, we were in the first four verses of this book. And it begins by saying, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Now, what's being said there is that the first three quarters of your Bible, what's called the Old Testament, okay, that is God speaking to ancestors through prophets, through kings, through priests, through angels, through visions, through dreams, through miracles. God spoke in all these different ways. But in recent times, he's spoken to us through his Son. And really, that is where we are going to be for for several weeks, is looking at the Son. Really, the entire book is about Jesus Christ, God's Son. Week two, we saw how Jesus was greater than the angels, that the message and salvation he brought was greater than anything that was given through the angels, through the prophets, through the priests. Certainly, um, uh, his salvation is, is bigger and better than the law and trying to keep the, the Old Testament commands. If, you're, if you know the Ten Commandments, uh, Jesus is greater. And so all of chapter one really speaks of his divinity, that that though he was a human, a little bit lower than angels for a time, he is exalted. He is alongside God. He is God. Last week, Steve started into chapter two, which gave us this command to pay careful attention to these things, to heed, to hear, and to take in this message of, of Jesus. And then it moved into looking at Jesus in his humanity. And so chapter one about Jesus in his divinity, that he is God, that he is God's son. Chapter two is really looking at Jesus as a human, as a man, as a person. It might be tempting for you and I even to think that Jesus is kind of this like superhuman, this, this you know, altogether different man. No, he, he was a person just like you and just like me. And we need to hear that because that's really important to today's message to recognize that uh, just as we spent a couple weeks on Jesus' divinity, we're spending a couple of weeks on Jesus' humanity, a person, a man with weaknesses, able to experience pain and temptation and struggle and suffer. We need to hear that he was a person, a man, a human being, just like you and just like me. And that brings us up to today, where we're going to be looking at the second half of chapter two. And I've titled this message, uh, Jesus Brings Us Through What He's Already been, Been Through. You just imagine Jesus is kind of this forerunner, the first one through the door. And because he's gone through, he can bring us with him. And we're going to see that in a couple, couple different fashions. So let me read our sermon, our, our scripture for this morning. 
In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So that's that's the scripture that we're going to be walking through this morning, um, the second half of chapter two, looking at Jesus and his humanity. But in order for us to really grab hold of what the author is trying to communicate here, we need to look at two other stories, two other stories that get introduced in our reading for today. One is from Psalm 22 and the other is from Isaiah chapter eight. I want to just recount those um, and then show how they're impactful in today's uh, passage. So story number one is about King David. And we find this story in Psalm 22. There's three parts of the story. David crying out to be saved. David expressing trust in God despite not yet being saved. And then part three is David declaring to future generations that they are going to hear about God's salvation. They're going to trust in God just like David did. And so just to take this a little bit deeper, the, the context that David is in when he writes these words and, and speaks this uh, to God is he feels surrounded by enemies, by threats. And so he is crying out to God for deliverance, for salvation, but he feels forsaken by God. He doesn't feel heard by God. God hasn't rescued him. He hasn't saved him. And so David is in anguish. It says that he is afraid for his life. He feels scorned, despised, attacked. These threats of the enemies, I mean, being compared to these uh, voracious, uh, ferocious animals being around him, ready to tear him to pieces. And then something interesting happens in verse 21. All of a sudden, the, this switch gets kind of flipped. And no matter what David has said in the past, he affirms that God is able to save him. It's, it's very unique. If you, if you read through the, the whole passage, all of a sudden, David says, I trust that God is going to deliver me, even though I'm not yet saved, even though the story is ongoing and I still am surrounded by these enemies. He expresses trust that God will save him. And then it ends, he, he kind of looks ahead to future generations, looking back on this scenario where he is going to be saved and therefore they're going to express faith and trust in God, looking back at God working in David's life. So that's, that's the first story that we need to be aware of. Kind of David being encircled, fear for his life. He reaches out to God. He expresses trust in God. And he believes that people are going to see his deliverance, his salvation, and, and come to faith in God too. The second story has some similarities to this first story, but it's found in Isaiah chapter 8. In that story, the three parts are this. Isaiah speaks of judgment because God's people trust in their own might. Part two of the story is that Isaiah expresses trust in God despite not yet being saved. And part three is that Isaiah declares he and his commands will be signs and symbols of the Lord's salvation. So the context here is that some of God's people, of which Isaiah is one of them, in that area, in that space, had gone to war and had won some victories. And so they had increased in, in power and plunder. They have these resources and they're, they're feeling invincible. They're feeling uh, bolstered in their own strength. And so they make the decision to go and conquer other areas, other cities, other towns that are occupied by God's people. And Isaiah, led of God, is going to speak words of rebuke, words of judgment against them. 
warning about them trusting in their own might. Isaiah, not really knowing where God's judgment is all going to fall and how it's going to impact him as, as a prophet, expresses trust in God. Even though he ha- has not been saved at this point, is the, the story is still ongoing, he, like David, expresses trust in God. And then here's part three, that Isaiah declares that he and his companions will be signs and symbols. That somehow what is going to transpire is going to allow Isaiah and his companions, the people with him, to be remembered uh, as, as people who received the salvation of God. So those are the two stories. Let me put them side by side real quick. Um, notice how parts two and three of the stories are very, very similar. But I just want to take a moment to highlight part one and why um, we need to, to recognize the differences because it's going to be important in the, in the Hebrews passage here in a moment. David is crying out for salvation in weakness. Okay? Okay. So he is doubting in the goodness of God, the power of God. Is God hearing him? Is God going to rescue him? So there's there's this struggle that David has. God, are you there? Are you strong enough? Are you going to do this? Are you good? Right? So that's, that's his struggle early in the story. And for Isaiah and the people, God's people in that story, it's not that they're doubting whether God's going to show up about, you know, kind of bringing deliverance and salvation. The problem in that story is they're believing that that salvation is going to come from their hands, their own might, their own power is going to rescue them. So it's not calling out for God at all. They believe that they can do it without God. And so we kind of have this spectrum that's set up. These, these two stories kind of serve as bookends, representing power and strength and weakness and vulnerability. Okay. So in these stories, these, these uh, leaders are going to call out for God's salvation, trust God's salvation in weakness and in, in situations of strength. And the insinuation is, and in everything in between, okay? So with that as a backdrop, and, and just kind of taking those stories with us now to today's passage, let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 again. So in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting. Now, before I go any further, let me just highlight that piece and bringing many sons and daughters to glory. What's, what's being referenced there? Well, remember verse nine that Steve preached on last week. In verse nine, it says, Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. And we're, we're gonna see glory and honor here in verse 10, right? So we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So Jesus is glorified. Jesus is honored. Jesus is lifted up. Why? Because he went to the cross, because he died. And scripture says he died and tasted death for who? For everyone. So there's something about Jesus going to the cross, dying, tasting death for everything, that on on consequence of that, as a result of that, he is glorified. And not only that, verse 10 says he's able to bring other people with him, bring other people into glory, bring other people into this place of salvation. Because of all that, it was fitting that God, for whom and through him everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. So we believe that all things are from God, through God, and to God. But this last little part here, that God should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. What's going on here? Well, the pioneer of their salvation is referencing Jesus. And pioneer could be translated in your Bibles as as forerunner or, or champion or victor. Or pioneer this, this idea of kind of going out into this new horizon, this new place no one has ever been. Uh, Jesus is pictured there as this pioneer of salvation, the rescuer, right? But then this unique piece, he is made perfect through what he suffered. What's, what's going on there? What, is, what does that mean that he was made perfect through what he suffered? I can remember reading this for the first or second time or third time uh, ever reading the Bible back as a college student going, I thought Jesus was perfect. How, how did he become perfect? How was he made perfect? And this doesn't mean that he was sinful and then became sinless or he was imperfect and became perfect, but rather that there were some things that were unfulfilled that Jesus fulfilled. There were some things that were incomplete that he completed. What does that mean? Well, in his infancy, 
he hadn't brought all things to completion. In his teenager years, he hadn't brought all things. There's something that living from, from the beginning of life through adulthood that Jesus was gonna bring about some things. What is that? Well, you and I, and really going all the way back to Adam and Eve, we as human beings, we as men and women, were called to live under God in ways that honor God. But we haven't done that. You haven't done that. I haven't done that. Adam and Eve didn't do that, okay? Who did that? Jesus did that. Jesus lived the life that we were supposed to live. Jesus was the one who went through life living it perfectly. And in so doing, he fulfills all righteousness, scripture says. Jesus completes the task that you and I are unable to do. And so in that, he was made perfect by going through the human experience and going through it perfectly. One of those experiences that he went through was even in suffering. He fulfilled all righteousness. Even when he suffered, he continued to trust God and live for God alone. Verse seven sa- or 11 says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. And I just want to be clear about this. The one who makes people holy, that's God. God does that. Jesus does that. But it doesn't go on to say, and those who make themselves holy get to join God as part of his family. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you and I sanctify ourselves. You and I cleanse ourselves. You and I make ourselves perfect, clean ourselves up. And then God welcomes us in. It says, no, we are a part of his family on account of what? The one who makes people holy made us holy. Therefore, we're a part of his family. So much so that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He calls us part of his family. Hearing that, you and I should feel this kinship with Jesus. We should feel a connection with Jesus that he does not call us enemy. He does not call us stranger. He does not call us acquaintance. He does not call us just somebody he created. He uses Terms of affection, titles of endearment, brothers, sisters, part of his family welcomed in. It's after this that Jesus is going to quote Psalm 22 and Isaiah 8. Jesus says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. Jesus is now grabbing onto the same language of King David and saying, I'm going to declare the name of God, declare your salvation to my siblings, to my brothers and sisters in this assembly. And again, now he quotes Isaiah chapter eight, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children of God, the children God has given me. So how do we make sense of this in the context of Hebrews chapter two here? What, what's being said? Well, the author is identifying Jesus with King David and identifying Jesus with Isaiah and using it for his purpose. There's something that Jesus went through in his life, in his ministry, that marks him as, as being one with David and one with Isaiah, Have gone, going through similar experiences. How so? Well, let me go back to that three-part uh, deal here. Jesus, like David, is going to cry out for salvation in weakness. Even in the midst of that, though, he is going to express trust in the Father, and eventually he's going to declare to future generations that about God's salvation and that they will trust in God too. Where do we see this? Well, most notably in the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus is crucified, he prays to the Father. He talks to his Father. Remember this, when the disciples fell asleep? Um, What does he say? He says, Father, if this cup can be taken from me, can you take this cup from me? Will you take this cup, which is symbolic of wrath and judgment? He says, will you take it from me? I'm not up to this. I don't want this. Jesus cries out, Father, rescue me, spare me. And yet ends that prayer by saying, not my will, 
but yours be done. Jesus says, not what he wants, but what the Father wants. Let God's will be done. Let their plan of salvation move forward. And then on account of his death, believing that generations will hear about this salvation and trust in God too, which is what has happened. Ever since Jesus died on that cross, salvation has been proclaimed in his name. Many people, thousands, millions of people have placed their trust in Jesus have turned a a deaf ear and a blind eye to the promises of this world and ways that the world would say salvation is found in politics. Salvation is found in wealth. Salvation is found in finding a spouse. Salvation is in the car that you drive. Salvation is you standing on the right side of history. Salvation is you being able to express your individualism. All these messages of salvation fall flat. And what Jesus is saying is, My salvation, my death on the cross to rescue you, to heal you, to cleanse you, to to help you. It will be declared and it will be believed for generations to come. That's exactly what has happened. So Jesus is like King David, but Jesus is also like Isaiah. How so? He speaks judgment against selfish pride and power. In the midst of that, he's going to express trust. And then consequently, he and his companions will become signs and symbols of the Lord's salvation. Now, let me walk through this. When does Jesus speak judgment against selfish pride and power? Throughout his life, throughout his ministry, throughout his teachings. He warned the religious leaders about some of the things that they were uh, clinging to, this power that they had that they were putting this heavy yoke upon followers, things that they wouldn't even do. They just, the power, the religious power got to their head. He warned political leaders, those who had governmental power, he warned them. Those who had riches, he, he told them, don't trust in your wealth. Don't trust in your riches. He came against this kind of selfish pride and power that they didn't need God. They didn't need his help that they were quite all right on their own. And Jesus speak words of rebuke, of warning, of judgment, that God is going to come against sin. But here's the wrinkle in the story. Jesus doesn't just speak against that judgment. Jesus lays down his life and receives that judgment. Jesus speaks against the people who are seeking power. And then he actually empties himself in that. He's going to win this battle by laying down his life, not exerting force and authority and power, but by laying down his life in salvation. So he expresses trust. Uh, Second Corinthians 5 21 says, Jesus who knew no sin, who was without sin, became sin, became the recipient of judgment so that you and I might become the righteous of God. You and I might receive salvation. So Jesus expresses trust that God's going to bring forth salvation as he lays down his life, as he receives this weight of judgment, this pain and suffering of going to the cross. And yet we know through his vindication, through his resurrection, Jesus has risen out of the grave. He's able to declare to his others and really commission Um, with, with authority and power, he commissions the disciples to be signs and symbols to bring forth the Lord's salvation, to warn others, don't trust in riches, don't trust in your own power, trust in Christ. And so therefore we see Jesus being identified with those who would want power and those who were living in weakness, kind of the whole spectrum Jumping back now to Hebrews chapter two, it says, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus shared in their humanity. Jesus, just like you, just like me. And by his death, he breaks the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So let's, let's kind of imagine this with a, a little bit of a different example. Let's imagine that you just were, uh, went through an inauguration. You were cloaked in the power of being a commander in chief over the U.S. military. Incredible power, right? Now, how do you know 
that you can live with the temptation not to abuse that power, not to misuse that power. There's no way to know whether you could uh, live up under that pressure, under that temptation, unless you actually do it. And there's only one person right now, Joe Biden, who was just uh, inaugurated. He's the only one with the authority and power of being commander in chief that will experience the temptation potentially to misuse or abuse this power or to use it in blessed ways and in good ways and healthy ways. And now compare it to this idea. It's Jesus not having fear of death, not wondering about it. Jesus actually going into death, cloaking himself with death and breaking through, breaking free, breaking out, risen from the grave. So Jesus enters into that place in the same way that Biden entered into this place of commander in chief. He enters into that space, breaks out, breaks free from death. And so no longer is Jesus at all worried about death being a victor, being this great uh, unbeatable enemy. Jesus has defeated death. Jesus has broken the power of death. And the devil that would want to hold people in fear of death, Jesus breaks that. We don't need to fear death. We need to fear the one who is stronger than death. We need to be in reverent awe of the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Our passage finishes out with uh, a few verses here. It says, surely it is not angels he helps. This is not for angels. This is for you and for me. For this reason, Jesus became like us, fully human in every way, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. High priest being the one who kind of is in between God and people. Jesus becomes this merciful and faithful high priest going through this human experience being made human in every way, tempted in every way, just like you, just like me, standing in that place between God and us. He's faithful, he's merciful, and he makes atonement for the sins of the people. Just like the priests of the Old Testament were called to do, Jesus makes atonement. He covers us. He saves us. And then it says, here, here's the big cap at the end of this. Because he himself suffered, because he himself went through all these things, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, what is, what, what is a consequence of that? He is able to help you and me who are being tempted. He goes through this life as a man, as a human being, as a mortal, able to experience suffering and pain, alienation, isolation, loneliness, temptations for power, Temptations to take and make use of the authority that the Father has given him. Tempted in every way, yet without sin. And therefore, he is able to tempt those or help those who are being tempted. Jesus brings us through because Jesus has been through. So the answer of, you know, kind of, so what? Who cares about all these things? Let me give you some things to think about this week. Remembering the experience of David or of Isaiah and God's people in Isaiah's story, have you ever experienced weakness, worry, alienation, isolation, hatred, attacks, rejection, suffering? Because that's all the experiences of David and all the experiences of Jesus in his earthly life. What about threats from others? Anger, judgment, fear of death, temptations, for power, temptations to misuse or abuse power like it was for God's people in Isaiah's account. In one account, have you ever been tempted to believe that God doesn't hear you, that God doesn't see you, that God can't rescue you, that, that the challenges that you're facing are too great for God, too big? That was David's experience. Or Isaiah and, and those people tempted to believe that they didn't need God. Tempted to believe that the work of their hands, their own intelligence, their own fortitude, their own abilities would rescue them, would say they don't have need for God. Have you, have you ever been tempted in these ways, friends, in weakness or in power to not trust in God, to not believe in God, wondering if he's there, not needing him to be there? If so, the great news this week is that Jesus 
having gone through these very same things, is able to help us through. He's able to help you and I through our fear, through our suffering, through our struggles to trust in our loneliness, in our hopelessness and helplessness. When we have desires for power, to misuse or abuse power, when you and I face temptations to trust in worldly strength, worldly riches, worldly alliances, and worldly powers, Jesus can bring us through those things, friends, because Jesus has been through those things. He is the pioneer of this salvation. He is the forerunner. He goes first. He's the champion. He's the victor, and we follow. He brings us through. He makes us holy. We're the ones who are made holy. He's the victor. We get to join him in his victory. And so I want to ask some questions as we think about this, uh, this idea that Jesus brings us through what he's already been through. As we think about Jesus experience, what we've experienced, Jesus having gone through what we go through or are going through right now. As we think about Jesus bringing us through all things because he's been through all things. What does this look like in your life? What does this look like in my life? What does this mean for us later this afternoon or through our week as we go about work, friendships, relationships, as we engage the issues of our world and society? I want to remind us of some things. Just, just reminding us of the truths of this passage as it relates to some of the experiences that we have. Jesus brings us through alienation because he's already been through alienation. Jesus brings us through fear because he's already been through fear. He's faced it. He's conquered it, right? Jesus brings us through threats to his life because he's already been through it. Jesus brings us through seasons and times of mocking or insults or scorn because he's already been through mocking and insults and scorn. Jesus brings us through rejection because he's already been through rejection. Jesus brings us through temptations of power because he's already been through temptations of power. All authority in heaven and earth was given to him. And what did he do with that? He made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He could have conquered with such might. And he does it. He lays down his life as a sacrifice. I want, to th- I want you to think right now the challenges that you're going through in your life. What is the trial? What is the temptation? What is the struggle? Where are you experiencing pain and suffering? Is it in a place of weakness like King David where you feel threatened? Maybe you've called out to God for help, for deliverance, and you don't feel like he's hearing you, he's answering you. Do you feel weak and vulnerable, exposed, mocked, ridiculed? Do you feel alone? hopeless and helpless? Or is your temptation not one of weakness, wondering if God's there, but is your temptation more saying, God, I don't need you to be there. This is my life. I'm in control. I have power. I'm fine on my own. I don't need you. I'm plenty capable, plenty strong, plenty smart, plenty rich to do this without you. I want you to fill in this blank. Jesus brings you, Jesus brings us through what? What is it for you, friends? Because I can guarantee you, Jesus has been through that. He's conquered that. He's overcome that. He is the pioneer of our salvation. He is the forerunner. He's the victor. He's our champion. He has been through this entire human experience, tempted in every way, yet without sin, fulfilling all righteousness where you and I fell short. Jesus always found success, always honored the Lord. Jesus can bring us through because he has already been through. What is it for you? Whether a place of weakness or power or something in between, Jesus brings us through because he's already been through it, friends. What is it for you? And as you fill in that blank, as was asked of David, as was asked of Isaiah, as was asked of Jesus in the garden and as he hung on that cross, do you trust he will do it? 
Do you trust that he will answer? Do you trust that he will show up? Do you trust that he will deliver? Do you trust that he will bring you through? Do you trust in his salvation? He is the rescuer. He is the hero of the story, Hope Community. Let's pray together. Jesus, I don't know everybody that might be tuned in right now, but you do. You know them full well. You know the plans that you have for them. You know that they are challenged, they are stressed, they are tempted, they suffer, they have pain points. You know them. And so God, right now, will they offer those up to you? Will they trust that you can bring them through because you've already been through. Father, I read this week that the name Isaiah means the Lord is salvation. May all of us bear that name, Isaiah. May the Lord be our salvation individually with our own unique challenges and struggles. But may the Lord be our salvation here at Hope Community. May the Lord be our salvation this week. May the Lord be our salvation as we think about sharing your light, your love, your life, your death, your victory with our world. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're really glad that you joined us this morning. Join us next week as Pastor Steve starts Hebrews chapter 3. Now to leave you with a verse that you might have seen uh, from one of the prayer prompts earlier. It's from Philippians 2 verses 2 through 4, and it says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I pray that your hearts and minds would be open to seeing the needs of others today. Happy Sunday.